Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, before I, I go to my PowerPoint presentation, just like Francis, I would just like to say that I'm also a daughter of an Anglican priest <laughs> who is an, an indigenous person. And, uh, and we were brought up basically learning uh, both the Igorot values as well as the Christian values. I was asked to talk about the leadership of indigenous peoples in terms of uh, protecting and uh, sustainably managing the forest. So I'll just uh, talk about the, uh, the outline. In, in my outline, I'll just first talk about the history of the struggles of indigenous peoples to protect their uh, forests. Secondly, I'd like to, uh, to talk about the integrated and holistic approaches that indigenous peoples have taken to, to be able to do this. Thirdly, some of the successes at the national and global uh, levels in terms of advocacy and also in terms of uh, campaigns. And then the links between climate change solutions and uh, biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. And of course, the respect for indigenous people's rights. And then the last point will be some uh, few challenges that I would like to pose to, the, to, the, to you all here. So, okay, so first, yeah. So uh, as, as uh, indigenous, main indigenous peoples who live in forests really have, the, the main struggles revolve around uh, how they can protect their lands, uh, territories, and resources, particularly the forest ecosystems which they are dependent upon. And if you look, uh, even me, uh, I, I was involved very much with the hydroelectric dam uh, issue in the Chico River Dam issue in the Cordillera, but it was also very much related to the forest because the dams are going to destroy the forests. Okay, next. Uh, so it remains a continuing struggle up to the present, and it's a struggle that happens locally up to the global level. And uh, so basically the, that the, the way indigenous peoples have dealt with this is really to strengthen their communities at the local levels to be able to have the possibility of resisting the incursions and the, uh, the destruction of their forests. But of course they also have to develop networks uh, locally and not at the national level as well as at the regional and global level. So this is the kind of challenge that indigenous peoples face as they try to do what they can to protect the forest, which are of course uh, the, as I, the, the source of their identities, their cultures, the knowledge and the values that they, uh, they, they internalize. Okay, next. So uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the advocacy at the global level. As it was mentioned earlier by Francis that uh, indigenous peoples, because of all the problems they have been facing in their, in their communities, uh, and never got justice, you know, access to justice in their communities. They sought uh, to go to the international level, and the UN somehow presented that opportunity, which led to the drafting of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples until its adoption in 2007. This is a unique process within the UN because it's really a process which involves the rights holder them holders themselves, and not just states negotiating amongst themselves, you know. So it was a uh, it was a very unique experience within the UN, and, uh, and finally it got adopted in 2007. Before that, there is the ILO Convention 169 on Indigenous and Tribal Peoples, which is uh, ratified not by many countries, unfortunately, mostly in, in, in Latin America. You know? They are the ones who have ratified this convention. So uh, in, in this process, indigenous peoples assumed an important place in international human rights law. They were able to get, bring the UN Declaration into the, into the body of instruments and legal conventions on human rights. And this discrete body of law has, uh, is confirmed and protected indigenous peoples' individual and collective rights. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, basically human rights uh, struggles really revolved around individual human rights. So when we were uh, demanding for a UN declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples, the main objection of many states, particularly the UK, France, was that there's no such thing as collective rights. No, but of course we fought back and, and we finally got it in the declaration. So actually it's the UN declaration on indigenous peoples people's rights that really has va validated and strongly affirmed the validity of, uh, of uh, collective rights. Next. 
uh, of course, there was the establishment of spaces uh, in, within the UN. So my, my position now, my mandate, which is as, as the Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples, this was established in 2001. There's the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. These were the spaces that uh, we, we helped bring into existence. And this is the, the, these are the spaces where we come and talk about all the issues that we would like to the UN and the states to deal with. Uh, uh, indigenous peoples also have been actively act uh, involved with the sustainable development agenda. And uh, some of uh, the indigenous peoples have created their own approach or platform or, net, uh, or framework, which we call the indigenous peoples sustainable self-determined development. Sorry, can you just press, press, press? No, I just wanted to show that an example of, uh, of, uh, of a partnership that indigenous peoples built is this indigenous peoples global partnership on climate change, forest, and sustainable development. Actually, this was helped strongly by some of the Norwegian support that indigenous peoples have received. And so they were able to establish this partnership, which was the partnership that lobbied strongly for the inclusion of safeguards within the uh, red uh, uh, agreements arrived by the climate change uh, convention. Next. Uh, so these are the countries where this kind of partnership exists. And as you can see, it, these are countries that also sort of coincide with the countries below the equator, which Antonio presented earlier. Next. Next. And then this is, uh, this is the framework that, mainly that, uh, that this partnership has developed. And, um, and next. Basically, this, uh, this framework is uh, defined by putting human rights into the center of, uh, of, of development and, and uh, whether you call this sustainable development or what. The whole uh, approach is territorial management or the landscape approach or what the uh, CBD calls ecosystems-based approach. So it's really more integral in the way we, we look at our territories. It's knowledge and evidence-based using indigenous people's traditional knowledge practices and innovations, and also appropriate use of modern science and technology. You know, it's not as if we're just uh, focusing on our own knowledge. We also look at the, the science that's there and see how we can use it to promote further our own uh, development in our communities. Of course, uh, gender equality and intergenerational justice is also built in within that framework. Uh, interculturality, which means that you know we live in communities where there are different cultures, and whether these are uh, we are not just we are not homogenous, we are very diverse. So there has to be an intercultural approach, and then of course it should promote economic sufficiency, what we call it, just enough. So that's the framework that has been developed, and that's what's being used by several of the indigenous peoples who, are, who have agreed that this is the kind of framework they would like to use when they promote their own kind of development, or life plans, as some will call it. Next. So, uh, again, press. So in terms of how we do this, how indigenous peoples have done this, press again. They have done, uh, they have used several, uh, several approaches. For instance, one of the things they have done is to do uh, uh, resource inventories, you know, which, you can press. Yeah, and then where they plot, you know, they do sampling plots of their communities, of their forest, see, you know, the kinds of the, uh, uh, diversity that's there, and then a plot where there are old trees, young trees, and in this basis, they will be able to make a land use plan that will guide them and how they will further protect and manage their forest. Next. Sorry, yeah, you just... Yeah. So uh, this is, for instance, in, 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 in Vietnam, they do these things. They do resource inventory. The people themselves within the commune go and even measure their own trees to see how much carbon these uh, trees contain. Next. Uh, this one is where they will look at all the different plants, make a list of what they have and, uh, and put the local names together with all the plants and uh, diversity that they find in their territories. This is in the Philippines. I can. And then, of course, one of the things they do is to do community participatory mapping. No? And this is very much used by indigenous peoples in, 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 the, area, in the countries where uh, the partnership is working. And as you can see, they really plot very, very uh, uh, 
carefully all the different landscapes and uh, and uh, even the present, past, and land uh, and the future. And, and they think of it in terms of future land use as well. As indigenous peoples, main, usually when we talk about a community, we talk about a community of the past, the present, and the future. You know, we just don't talk about the community right now, but we really look at the past and we think of the future, seven generations ahead. What will be that community like? Next. So in, this, uh, in doing these community participatory mapping processes, uh, you can see how they, they, they discuss, they or we organize the communities, they analyze what they have found in the data that they have generated, and then they create a timeline that will refer, refer to the important time, uh, the events in the community that will really uh, show a spatial uh, presentation of the past and the present. Uh, so they also look at the land use map. How are this? Uh, uh, how is that map showing how the different land uses are next? And so, for instance, this is an example of one of our uh, province uh, uh, towns in the Cordillera where I come from. And you can see that in one area where there are forests, rice lands, etc., these are all the diverse land uses that they have identified, and they have the local names on how they have used these, which includes, of course, rice fields, uh, uh, forests, uh, 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 pasture lands, etc. They they map all of this to show that, uh, and that's where you can appreciate very much the territorial approach to land use uh, management. Thank you. Oh, next. And uh, they identify what are the knowledge and practices, the belief systems that link with the different land uses, the customary laws that guide that, and of course the the, the collective cultural practices and the collectivity, the reverence for nature. All of these are also included in their maps when they make it. Next, so uh, these are just examples of how this is being done in the various places. Next. And uh, one of the important things that also happens in many different communities is the role of the healers and the shamans, no? because they are the ones who really know more about which are the plants and what uses these are. So they always play a very key role in the, uh, in the approach that has been adopted. Next. Uh, uh, this is one example of our partner in Horaima in Brazil, the, the Sears. Uh, where they have also defined a territorial management plan and they develop this and then they create rituals where they agree on these plans. Uh, in, in, in Africa, we, and in, in various parts, they also have developed what they call the biocultural indigenous calendars, where each month they will identify what are the activities that they do, and, you can, and in the calendars, then you will know also how to be guided with the plans. Next. So, uh, so that's just uh, to show the kind of work that's happening at the ground level, because that's really where the kind of leadership emerges. No, we have joint ad advocacy programs and activities at the global level. I mentioned earlier we did influence uh, the, the Cancun safeguards on, on Red Plus, which recognized the, the traditional knowledge and also uh, noted the existence of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. No? And then, of course, we have to develop partnerships with other movements, no? because we cannot just do this on our own. Next. Yeah, so these are just some of the, the uh, UN bodies where the indigenous peoples engage with, you know, the Office of the, High, the, the, High, the Human Rights Council. We also engage with the uh, Permanent Forum, the World Intellectual Property Rights, where we talk about cultural appropriation and how to protect the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples, as well as all these different bodies. Uh, recently, the more active engagement of indigenous peoples was also with the Green Climate Fund to make sure that the safeguards are in place and that grievance mechanisms are, are put in place when indigenous peoples will suffer or will have to, you know, when hydroelectric dams, for instance, are built and the rights of indigenous peoples are violated. Next. Uh, so well, uh, so that's my two last slides. Uh, so there are successes and gains at the national level, no? like the, for instance, the Constitutional Court of Indonesia, uh, 
was, has affirmed that the customary forests are owned by indigenous peoples, which is really a big gain. And this has been propelled by uh, AMAN, the National Federation of uh, Indigenous Peoples in Indonesia. Of course, there's an increase in number of demarcated lands you know, in, in several countries. In Brazil, Brazil actually at the earlier stage was the, like the valedictorian in terms of the increase in numbers. Unfortunately, that is, uh, that is being, uh, how do you call, uh, re the, uh, removed. These lands are again being uh, encroached upon. No? There are also pro uh, processes by which indigenous peoples declare their own autonomy. Recently, I was in Lima, and the One Piece Nation came and talked with me, and they told me about how they have declared their territory, which is like thousands of hectares, as an autonomous nation. And they are the ones who will determine what will happen in that, uh, in that uh, community. They have developed community protocols as well. No? And several indigenous peoples in different parts of the world have done that as well. And uh, of course, the links between uh, rights is really something that's very crucial. The issue of forest is one of the major human rights issues that I have been, uh, I have been encountering in my mandate as the rapporteur. No? And uh, research evidence now have shown that uh, where the rights are respected, that is where the forests are also better kept. No, and these are researches done by the World Resources Institute, the Rights and Resources Initiative, etc. Increasingly, there is evidence that links, that makes the direct link between respect for rights and uh, land tenure security and uh, forest conservation and protection. No, next. And so. Uh, uh, these are some of the findings you know, that uh, indigenous peoples manage at least 24% of the total carbon stored above ground. You know, and, uh, and also that indigenous peoples who live in 22% of the land, uh, they are the, in, it's in their territories with 80% of biodiversity is still found. You know? So these are the contributions. And then, and then finally, we have this uh, also uh, data which shows that if the carbon up, uh, found in the tropical forests are uh, lacking, you know, if the lands are lacking in formal recognition, then there's a very high risk of increasing uh, carbon dioxide emissions, you know, in the world. Okay, last. I think it's the last. No, no, and then the, of course, in terms of human rights violations, we have had several data which shows that uh, indigenous peoples are really the majority of so-called environmental or human rights defenders who are being killed and assassinated. In my mandate, I, have, I, I was working with Berta Cáceres, for instance, from Honduras, when uh, she brought me to her community. Three months after I left the community, she was assassinated, and then that continues up till now. In fact, a few weeks ago, I was in Honduras again to follow up on how the investigation is taking place. No? The criminalization of indigenous people's livelihood activities is also happening. You know? in, in Thailand, for instance, indigenous peoples were arrested because they were practicing shifting cultivation and they were charged of causing greenhouse gas emissions, etc. No? Okay. So, uh, last. Yeah, yeah, the use of anti-terrorist laws to to criminalize indigenous peoples. And presently, you know, there are growing incursions into indigenous people's territories, whether, whether these are mining, infrastructure, et cetera. You know? And, and uh, last week, I was in Lima actually talking about the situation of indigenous peoples in voluntary isolation. Who are the ones who live in the forest? And they are heavily threatened now of e either dying because of the health consequences of people coming into their communities. So they are just pictures of the kind of criminalization happening against indigenous peoples, the evacuations, displacement happening. And finally, uh, so these are the challenges that I think should be, uh, we should talk about how do we strengthen the voices you know, that support and protect the rights of indigenous peoples? How do you do timely and, uh, and appropriate responses to emergency alerts, you know, when indigenous peoples are being evicted or displaced and, and militarized. And of course, the issue of access to justice. Indigenous peoples rarely have any access to justice, even if they win the cases in the courts. You know, I, I have several cases in the inter-American court, which the indigenous peoples won, but it's hardly enforced. You know? And finally, support for indigenous peoples, of course, to upscale and uh, replicate their efforts and then yeah so that's it thank you very much